Well, I'd just like to um, ask you, Jan, um, something about the, the journey to some of the subjects um, in history which you've taken up recently. One of the, uh, the big areas that I think that, um, well, it was certainly the, a very big area which many people have uh, you drawn on is the work that you did on your, the concept that you developed and the work that you did on the Industrious Revolution. Perhaps you could quickly explain the Industrious Revolution. Uh, we know what the Industrial Revolution is, but what, what, what was this Industrious Revolution? Um, Yes, so perhaps you could just, just start there because it's also a concept that has been used now by people have, are using it in areas of the world with, that you didn't really think mm -hmm. about applying it to. So, right. yes. Okay, well, the term Industrious Revolution uh, was uh, coined, I believe, by Akira Hayami in Japan. And uh, he... Uh, what he had in mind with yes. the term was the uh, industrious behavior of peasant households, that is, uh, working, uh, all the family members working long hours, uh, exploiting their limited amount of land, and adding to that the production of uh, 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 manufacturers, uh, the so-called proto-industrial mm -hmm. output, uh, uh, to uh, fill up all the, uh, the available time of the, of the household. So that self-exploitation, yeah. that industriousness, uh, was, uh, he saw as a path to the, uh, the growth of the Japanese economy over time. Uh, it was very much a supply side yes. issue in his mind. But my own, when I heard the term, what I immediately associated with in the Western context, in the European context, in the early modern period, was the um, uh, industrious activity motivated by a desire to consume goods that could only be acquired through the market. So if there are, if, if the, well, what an economist will call the tastes of the, of the consumers change, now how do they change? Right. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> uh, if they change in such a way that uh, there's a great desire for more cash income, then the household members have to consider, well, uh, how, can we, how can we achieve this? What, uh, uh, what uh, should we produce new goods that we might sell? Or should we enter into uh, wage labor contracts? Uh, uh, should not only the breadwinner, but also his spouse and his children uh, engage in these things? Um, so the industrious revolution is a sort of a two-sided coin. On the one side, there is the industrious behavior that Hayami spoke of, more work for the market, of the, by the household, but on the other, and then this is the critical part that I add to it, is the, uh, the new demand for consumer goods, the new aspirations and how to achieve them. And um, so then the larger project then, mm -hmm. I have these house, this model of a household and how it functions, makes decisions about who works and how much and how do we consume? Do we produce things of our own or, or do we buy, do, do we purchase them in the market, uh, which requires cash income? Uh, that's the heart of the model, but the larger context of how the households make these decisions is the economic environment that they're in. And in the course of the 17th century, that's one in which is being enriched by uh, new mm -hmm. goods, particularly from outside of Europe. So globalization at first right, yes. comes into my story through the world of goods yes. and how the households respond to them. Um, and uh, the, well, that's what globalization, what uh, the industrious revolution uh, concept yes. uh, means in the way I've used it. Now, one of the um, one of the interesting things that I've read in your work uh, mm -hmm. recently is um, some of the work you did on trying to discover just how much of this these these goods were coming in mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. from distant parts of the world, not just other. Um, outside the local village or outside yeah. even the region, but actually from Asia. Yeah. And I think you estimated that there was probably about one uh, a pound of goods per person um, by the 18th century mm -hmm. that was uh, being consumed in these Northern European societies yeah. that were these Asian goods. Um, is that, you know, what, what are the ramifications of that? Just what, what does it, is it telling us that there's, you know, a really widespread 
big impact of, of, these, right. um, of these Asian cultures in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. Yeah. Well, one aspect of this study yeah. was to actually get a sense of the volume of uh, non-European mm. goods, particularly Asian goods, that were entering into mm. Europe. And I could measure that in global terms because we have reasonably good records of the number of ships <coughs> from all the European yes. trading companies that uh, you know, rounded mm. the Cape and made yes. their way back to Europe and sold their goods. And we know quite a bit about the content, that is, the, the lading and, mm -hmm. and which commodities yeah. they were. So once I sort of worked through all of that, I uh, was able to calculate that by the end of the, well, yeah. I think the 1780s, yes. uh, we had something like a pound per person. Mm. Right? Uh, well, that's for all of Europe, Europe Western and Central Europe. Yes. And of course, it wasn't evenly distributed, neither geographically yeah. nor by a social group. Uh, but it, it included commodities that were widely consumed. So uh, tea is the mm, obvious yes. example uh, for England and Northwestern Europe, but uh, 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 coffee, uh, textiles, uh, porcelain, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, pepper and the spices, of course, from going back to the 16th century. Well, this volume had been rising over time, and in the 18th century it reaches this point, but it had been growing steadily for, well, nearly 300 years. Now, a pound per person after 300 years of growth of this yeah. trade, in one respect, it's not very much. <laughs> it's uh, compared to the sheer volume of yes. goods being produced in Europe, it's tiny. By value, it's a little larger. Um, it does seem, to, though, to play a really strategic role in a part of Europe where the consu mm -hmm. consumption levels were much higher than in, yeah. in than elsewhere in uh, the well, Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. So, in Northwestern Europe, yeah. in Britain, the Low Countries, but parts of France and Germany, parts of Scandinavia, you could there was reasonable documentation to show that households were spending a, well, I'll just say a non-trivial part yes. of their income on, on these goods. And that, was a, mm. you know, that gives some yeah. quantification to my mm. claim about mm. the motivation for industrious yeah. behavior. Yeah. But so much more was being produced of these goods had a kind of demonstration effect. That is, they were imported at first, uh, but later on, well, cotton textiles yeah. is the obvious yeah. example, uh, they come to be produced in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, the coffee, imported from uh, the Arabian Peninsula mm -hmm. at first, and elsewhere in, in Asia, but eventually comes to be produced in the Caribbean yeah. and on a much larger scale. So there's a whole reorganization of an of a, uh, international economy that's participating in the, uh, uh, well, that is a, a part of this, yeah. this growing demand yes. in Europe for these yeah. new products. Um, I think one of the, the, I just wanted to, the, one of the really big um, impacts of, of your work was that it, it's actually the kind of point that you write it and the sorts of things that other historians were writing about at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, it was uh, this intersection with that work that was going on at the time on consumption among social and cultural historians mm -hmm. who were not doing economic history and among gender historians who also were not doing economic history. But you integrate this yeah. study of the household, mm -hmm. behavior in the household, the tastes and the um, actions of, of women and young women in the household. So this is something that it seems to me really drew economic history into that world of um, social and cultural history at a time when many young historians were really not interested in economic history yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. So it was, I think it, it was just, this is, it was really such an innovative um, model, um, a direction to take for that. But mm -hmm. just to pass on from there, um, I mean, I just sort of, what, what do you think about the, you know, Chris Bailey has used the concept of the industrious mm -hmm. revolution for these now, these other parts of the world. Right. Do you think he's, um, this is a, a good application or really is this something that really just applies more to Northwestern Europe, mm -hmm. uh, most of, you know, yeah. yes, those well, parts that, of Europe. Well, that's a question that I ask myself and, yes. and uh, I think is I become more involved in mm -hmm. the project yes. of global history, I might have an answer eventually. Yes. <laughs> but, but right now I would just say this. Um, uh, uh, I began thinking about yes. this in a what, what I would have to call a global context. That is some of the elements, certainly the theoretical elements of my work are based on 
uh, the insights of, well, Hayami uh, yes. studying Japan, of development economists yes. studying many places in the world, but not Europe. I mean, they're, they're studying yes. the Philippines yes. and other places uh, where I drew some inspiration. Yeah. And yet I thought it should be yes. applied to a relatively restricted area yeah. in Northwestern Europe, yes. or the classical area yes. of economic uh, mm. development and the mm. Industrial Revolution, and the areas of the highest income mm. in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, now, look, part of that is that I, I shine the spotlight on one place and I say, ah, there, there it is, yes. right? Yes. If I shine the spotlight somewhere else, if yeah. I knew as much yeah. about other places, would I have a broader view of this? I, Yes. can only say maybe. But as other people make use of it, and as Chris yes. Bailey did, yes. it, it, gets, it gets you to thinking, mm. right? And well, that's the way scholarship yeah. works. And uh, so right. all I can say is he got me to thinking, yes. and maybe he's right. Good. I think that's a great point to end on.